This is the fastest track in Formula One. It's seen the quickest laps and the highest average speeds. It's witnessed triumph and disaster. This is the Temple of Speed. This is Monza. For the Italian Grand Prix this weekend, Tech Talk is all about velocity. We'll see how fast the current generation of F1 cars really are. Find out how teams have shed drag to boost top speed and discover how Ferrari have upgraded their car for this weekend. Well, the question always comes up at Monza, just how fast are Formula One cars? And we can't give you an exact answer for the 2024 specification cars around Monza, well, because the race weekend isn't over as we make this. But what we can do is look at the next fastest track, the Belgian Grand Prix venue of Spa-Francorchamps. And let's take a look back at what the cars were doing in 2023, because I want to show you the order of not just the top speeds, but also how that top speed is made and the different ranking of the teams and their designs. So take a look at this table here. You can see on the Williams, the fastest car on the straight line around Spa, a chunk of their lap time made from DRS, their top speed from DRS, a chunk from the toe, and then their baseline top speed, 332 kph. And we use kph in Formula One because metric makes more sense. And you can see that 332 is the baseline for the Williams, but the baseline for the Alpine is 10 kph slower, but they're still pretty quick. But look how much difference the toes and the DRS make on different designs. Mercedes, great example of this, huge amount of DRS gain on their top speed, almost nothing in terms of toe, and a fairly low baseline. That's looking back at the Belgian data from last year. Well, if we take the same data from this year, you'll notice things have changed. The average top speed across the board, ever so slightly higher, but the order of things has changed substantially. Look at McLaren here. They've got a top speed of 355 kph. Now, if we look back to last year's data, McLaren wallowing down at 330. Now, there have been some setup differences, a result of the weather being unsettled on both years and setup options the teams made. But if you look at the different order of things, it's very, very different scope here. So have the cars got faster year on year? I think they have, our data team are looking at this as well. In some cases, they've got a lot faster. McLaren, Aston Martin have got significantly quicker. Other teams though, not so much gain, but a lot of it is down to individual setup cases on teams doing different things. So it's a little bit of a, not an exact answer here. And you can see in this situation, the toes aren't making a very big contribution in 2024. That's just the nature of that weekend. It doesn't mean toes are less effective this season. So there is a bit more to learn, but I just love this data set. So when we're looking at the top speed here, 356 kph from the Aston Martin. However, that's not the top speed we're gonna see. We're gonna see well in excess of 360 kph as we get later in the year in Mexico, and again in Las Vegas. So Monza is also a very fast circuit, but you're not gonna see the highest top speed. You're almost certain to see the highest average speed. And that means the cars have to be designed in a particular way to deal with the very specific circuit characteristics of the Italian Grand Prix circuit. Those long straights, that high average speed, mean the cars are set up in a very specific way. Let's have a look at Red Bull Racing. Now have a look at their front wing here. This is from earlier in the season. Look at the top element of the wing. It's got that distinctive wave. It's a it's pretty much standard F1 wing for the 2024 season. But when we move on to Monza, have a look. It looks like someone's had a little hacksaw out at the top edge of the wing, completely chopping down that upper element. Actually, the shape of the wing is quite different in a few other areas as well. This is all to do with reducing aerodynamic drag across the front of the car, indeed across the whole of the car. Now, if you're not sure about what aerodynamic drag is, we talk about reducing drag all of the time. Imagine you're sitting in the passenger seat of a road car going down a motorway or a freeway if you live in America. You put your hand out of the window at 40 miles an hour, even 20 miles an hour, you feel a resistance against your hand, pushing it backwards. That's, that's aerodynamic drag, essentially. If you do the same at 70 miles an hour, if you're allowed to do that on your local highway, put your hand out the window again from the passenger side, and you'll feel a much stronger force. That's aerodynamic drag. Now, if you turn your hand to the side like that, you'll feel that drag reduce. It might flutter up and down, but you'll feel that force reduce. That's reducing drag. And that's essentially what the teams are doing when they're trying to redesign their wings. Now, have a look at the Red Bull front wing here. You see how it's 
chopped down massively. Then we take another look at the higher downforce wings they've used earlier in the season. And again, look, much bigger, much bigger upper element, different shapes down here, still similar trend, but reducing that drag. That's what it's all about, getting that top speed, getting that average speed right around the circuit. It's the same at the rear wing. Red Bull coming with that very extreme chop down wing we saw briefly in Spa. And I can't help but think that Red Bull have taken the hacksaw slightly more to it around this element of the wing as well. Just chopping down a much higher downforce wing to try and reduce its drag, but still get some of that downforce generated by the underside of that big main plane. And I think that's something you're gonna see. You know, you can play this wing to a full downforce specification wing on the Red Bull. The difference is uh, day and night if you have a look at that. It's, it's a totally different set, set of uh, aerodynamic circumstances. Now again, using that example of sticking your hand out the car window, that wing there with the gurney on the back as well, that's really hanging back. That's generating a lot of downforce, yes, but it's creating a lot of drag. This wing, they've chopped out all of those sections, less air resistance, higher top speed, at least that's the theory. Then you start looking at other areas of the car because some teams have upgraded the cars in a slightly different way. Sauber here made a really quite interesting upgrade. I think this might not actually be doing anything to do with reducing drag, but I like the upgrade anyway. Notice this extra element in the mirror support. That's something they're doing to condition the flow, channel the airflow how they want it over the top of their side pods on that car. You compare that to the old specification, nothing there. So you can't compare nothing with something. Moving on to reducing drag, look at this. Everyone's been talking about this rear wing or tea tray or just small aerodynamic element. It's barely a wing, is it, on the back of the Alpine? You compare that to what the team run at other circuits, much bigger angles you're gonna see around the circuit. Uh, it's the same at the front. Alpine have gone a similar route to Red Bull in that they've chopped down an existing front wing. Very similar shape, actually, to that Red Bull wing we were looking at earlier. You can see, okay, not exactly the same shape, but it's uh, pretty similar in concept. Similar wind tunnels putting out similar results. Red Bull's wind tunnel, of course, much, much older. Sticking on the topic of front wings, let's take a look at Williams, because I think there's a really interesting little additional element, which is not what you sort of expect at Monza, that Williams have added to their front wing. It's not really a gurney, this, and I'm not sure if it's a sensor housing or if they're actually going to be using this out on track, but you can see it quite clearly there. This almost gurney-like element that's been glued ahead of the trailing edge of the front wing that sticks up a little bit more than perhaps you'd normally expect. You can see it's been taped on, which sometimes suggests sensors, but it's on both sides of the wing, and the team looked like they ran it in free practice. While I didn't get quite a good enough look, so maybe Williams taking a low drag wing and adding an extra little kick up on it. Interesting technology. And also to mount it slightly far forward of the trailing edge. That's something new. Sneaky way to get an extra element in there. We can take a look at Haas. They have two wing options at Monza. One with the straight upper edge and uh, one with a wobbly upper edge. Again, following that cut down wing route we've seen. McLaren tea tray style rear wing. You can see though in the background there, McLaren's front wing. Have a look at this. Again, someone's taken a Dremel out, haven't they? And just taken an existing wing and rather than having it go through here, they've chopped out a section here to reduce aerodynamic drag. Why have they chopped it out rather than make a bespoke wing? Because there's a cost cap. It doesn't cost anything extra to lop a section out very precisely, but lop a section out with a power tool than it does to manufacture a new wing. So that's essentially a free upgrade in terms of cost cap for McLaren, because all they've done is a bit of mechanic effort rather than making a completely new component. So that's probably a component we've seen already this season on the car. Now, how extreme do you go in terms of chopping down that aerodynamic drag? Well, probably the most extreme example you're gonna see at Monza this weekend is on the back of the Sauber. Ferrari powered cars looking quite quick on the straights, but look how tiny that wing is, if you can call it a wing, compared to what they normally run. Not only have they reduced the shape and the sort of aspect of the wing, they've also gone from having a twin rear wing support to a single support, and that's directly to reduce drag. So that's something Sauber have done Will it work out on track? Well, the figures so far suggest that the Sauber is pretty quick down the straights. The biggest upgrade at Monza, though, is the power unit supplier for that Sauber. It's Ferrari, and let's start with the rear wing. Yeah, it's pretty minimal, isn't it? You compare it to a wing they used earlier in the season, much shallower, much less aerodynamic drag. But let's take a look through the rest of the car because I think perhaps the biggest upgrade, this is a shot of the Ferrari from early in the season, is to the side pod of the car. And they've reduced the undercut of the side pod quite significantly in this area, but that's not the real story. The real story for Ferrari 
is around the floor of the car. When Ferrari introduced a new floor earlier this season, I think it was Imola, the car suffered a really bad bouncing characteristic and Ferrari spent an awful lot of time trying to understand what caused that and how to get rid of it. Has that work been effective? Well, Jock Clear answers the question at the back of the garage. Because it's only something that manifests itself, we've talked about this before, only manifests itself when you actually get in the real car, it's very difficult to model. The more track time you get, the more correlation you can get. So I would say we're comfortable with having correlated better what we're seeing. Obviously, we're not comfortable with the fact that some of our upgrades have been compromised somewhat by that bouncing, and the drivers have found that, yeah, it's got the downforce, but it's really difficult to actually drive the car uh, when that bouncing gets in, you know, starts to initiate. As I say, we're, we're comfortable that we're modelling that better now simply because we've got more data and, and we've tuned our models. And so going forward, we would expect that to be less and less of a problem. Uh, so towards the end of the year, uh, obviously we'll see some high downforce circuits again uh, where that might have reared its head earlier in the season and we're confident we'll be doing a better job for those. And I think a lot of what we've heard there is Ferrari applying those lessons to the car at Monza along with the drag reduction. And some of the detail changes Ferrari have made are really subtle. The rear view mirror housings, they've been revised ever so slightly, as have the supports. And this is something a lot of teams have been experimenting with all season long, with sticky uppy bits along here or trailing edges coming off the bottom of the mirror support. A few years ago, Ferrari introduced those drag reducing mirror housings in invented by that uh, university professor or student at the University of Miami, they seem to have fallen out of fashion. I think only one or two teams using them now. Ferrari going back to a conventional housing, but trying to use that to boost the airflow around the car. So that's something Ferrari are looking at, but the real story is all about that floor and how effective it will be. Well, even from looking from the back of the car, you can't really tell how much they've changed it because all of the good stuff is underneath and they keep it hidden unless a driver has a little bit of a mistake out on track. So to find out exactly how much effort Ferrari have put into this Monza package, because they're gonna to have to have developed this package specifically for the Italian circuit versus every other track in the season, and how much is just pure upgrade, Jock Clear, of course, has the answers. Downforce and drag are pretty much mutually exclusive. Uh, you, can, you can look at it that any time you're gonna put downforce on the car, it's gonna come with a little, little bit of drag, and obviously this circuit doesn't like drag, um, but all corners like downforce. So it's not a case of just getting the car to be minimum drag because then you will just be slow around the corners however much you, you make up down the straights. Uh, and that's where the tools uh, over the course of the last 18 months have led you to what sort of trade-off you can live with. And that's, that's the conundrum for all of the teams and that's what we call waiting. Um, so the teams have to decide how much you weight various aspects of the down first versus various aspects of the drag it's going to incur. Um, and how good a job you do depends on how well you tune those weightings, so to speak. But based on what we've seen this year, I think we're, we're comfortable that uh, we've got those weightings right. You know, when I say that, you're not looking at saying, OK, well, in which case, why aren't you faster in Zandvoort, for example? Uh, it's, it's the fact is, you know, uh, the weightings we use are the target for what we want to get. Whether you can achieve the, that optimum is, is another challenge and you're never, gonna, you're never gonna get exactly what you want, you know, because you're always getting stretched targets. Well, it remains to be seen whether this new aerodynamic package for Ferrari will have the fans chanting Forza Ferrari at the end of the Grand Prix or walking home to the train station feeling a little bit despondent because Team Papaya, the Silver Arrows or perhaps Red Bull have beaten them at the end of the Grand Prix. And if they have, it means that one of the other teams has picked up on how to develop a car to race around Monza at the high average speed slightly better than everybody else. And that is the glory of Monza and the glory of Formula One.